Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the program director of the Poetry Foundation, Steve Young. Welcome to Region 2, birthplace of such poets as Maya Angelou, Ted Kuzer, Carl Sandburg, Julia de Burgos, Lorreen Niedeker, and Donald Justice, to name just a few. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and all of our partners, I am so delighted to welcome you to the second semifinal competition of the 2017 Poetry Out Loud National Finals. I'd also like to give a special shout out to the poetry fans across the country that are tuned in via the live webcast at arts.gov. Welcome, America. Whether you're watching online or you're out in the audience at The Listener, you can follow the competition via Twitter at hashtag POL17. Since Poetry Out Loud began, more than 3.3 million students and 50,000 teachers from some 12,000 high schools across the country have participated. The students you'll hear today have advanced from a highly competitive field of hundreds of thousands of Poetry Out Loud participants nationwide in 2017. Okay, first let's go over how the competition will roll. In round one, each student will come on stage to recite their first poem. The order of recitation was randomly generated and will be honored for all three rounds of this semifinal. You can follow the order in your program. Students will begin each recitation with the poem title and the name of the poet. Judges are scoring the recitations as they happen, and they score as individuals, not by committee. In round two, students will recite their second poem, again in the same order as the first round. We'll then take a brief 10-minute break after the second round to finish tallying the scores. When we return, the host will announce the name of, names of the eight highest scoring students, our regional finalists. These eight students will then recite their third poem, again in the order listed in your program. After the third round ends, we'll announce the names of the fourth place honorable mention re recipient, as well as the three students with the highest scores. These top three students will be named national finalists and will compete in tomorrow night's national finals competition. A few reminders. In order to keep the semifinal on schedule, we ask that you hold your applause until after each recitation ends. Please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. Please do not take flash photography or stand in the aisles to take photos or videos during recitations. You may take non-flash photos and record from your seats. We have, a, we have photographers, a photographer and videographers documenting each semifinal and the national finals. Today's program will include American Sign Language interpretation on the right side of the stage. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge some of the many great people who have made Poetry Out Loud possible this year. First are 53 state and jurisdictional arts agencies and their respective Poetry Out Loud coordinators and partners. Each was responsible for running a statewide contest and sending a champion here to compete at the national finals. I know many of you are in the audience to cheer on your champions, so thank you so much for your hard work. Next, I'd like to acknowledge the dedicated teachers and coaches who got their students involved in Poetry Out Loud and spent countless hours supporting and encouraging them. Thank you for your leadership and commitment to arts education. Also, the families and friends of our state champions who come to Washington, D.C. to show their support. We imagine you've learned a little poetry along the way, uh, at the very least, about your students' three poems, and we're thrilled that you're able to be here today. Finally, to the many staff volunteers, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd also like to uh, point out a few important roles uh, in this semifinal. Serving as our prompter is Joe Tasker. He's there and our accuracy judge, Nancy Doherty. It's up there somewhere. So now, let's get things started by bringing to the stage our host. Anderson Wells is an actor and singer in the DC area. He's worked with theater education programs such as Center Stage in Maryland and Tyler Hill Camp in Pennsylvania. 
He has performed with many a cappella groups, including DC's Vox Pop and The Lobby. Currently, Wells is the education manager and registrar for Studio Theater and is the newest member of the faculty of Studio Theater Acting Conservatory. Wells has a BFA in acting from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and continues to train Studio Theater, con continues to train at Studio Theater Acting Conservatory. Please welcome Anderson Wells. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here again at the Poetry Out Loud semifinals. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce the judges for this semifinal. Jennifer Chang is a poet and a scholar. Her debut poetry collection, The History of Anonymity, was selected for the Virginia Quarterly Review's Poetry Series and was a finalist for the Shenandoah Glasgow Prize for Emerging Writers. Chang's work has appeared in many journals and anthologies, including the Poetry Society of America's New American Poet Series, the Helen Burns Poetry Anthology, New Voices. Her honors include fellowships from the McDowell Colony, Yaddo, and Virginia Commission for the Arts, among others. She teaches at the George Washington University and lives in Washington, DC. Christian Kahn is an actor living in New York City. His stage credits include roles with Classic Stage Company, Red Bull Theater, The Flea Theater, Ars Nova, and The Acting Company in New York. Regionally, he's played lead roles at the Shakespeare Theater, Old Globe Theater, the Guthrie Theater, the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, and numerous others. Kahn also works as a teaching artist for the acting company and has taught Shakespearean verse workshops all over the country. Brigitte Sharma is the author of Bliss to Film, Infamous Landscapes, Under Gloom, The Opening Question, and winner of the 2004 Fence Modern Poets Prize. Her poems and writing have appeared in Art Asia Pacific, Bomb, Boston Review, Fence, Women's Review of Books, and other journals. She earned her MFA from Brown University and an MA in Media Studies from the New School. Sharma is a professor at the University of Montana and is currently teaching at the Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa. Javier Zamora is a poet and a 2016-2018 Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. His poetry has appeared in several publications, including American Poetry Review, Plowshares, Poetry Magazine, The Kenyan Review, and The New Republic. Zamora holds fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Canto Mundo, Colgate University, and he received the 2016 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rose Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. His first book, Unaccompanied, is forthcoming from Cooper Canyon Press. Judges, you all have your work cut out for you. As a refresher for many of you, let me share what the judges will be looking for in each recitation. The following are the evaluation criteria for poetry out loud. Physical presence, voice and articulation, dramatic appropriateness, evidence of understanding, overall performance for which the score is more highly weighted, and accuracy. And with that, let's begin the competition. First up, representing Kansas, Sarah Grace Katsianis. Sarah is from Tipton, Kansas, and is a senior at Tipton Catholic High School. If Sarah could have a superpower, it would be to speak every language possible, even animal languages. She'd like to be able to communicate with everyone on the planet. She is passionate about creating, especially writing. Sarah Grace Katsianis. The Nail by C.K. Williams. Some dictator or other had gone into exile, and now reports were coming about his regime. The usual crimes, torture, false imprisonment, cruelty and corruption, but then a detail that the way his henchmen had disposed of enemies was by hammering nails into their skulls. Horror. Then what mine does after horror, after that first feeling that you'll never catch your breath, 
mind imagines how not to be annihilated by it. The preliminary tap feels it in the tendons of the hand, feels the way you do with your nail when you're fixing something, making something, shelves, a bed. The first light tap to set the slant, and then the slightly harder tap to embed the tip a little more. No, no more. This should be happening in myth, in stone or paint, not in reality, not here. It should be an emblem of itself, not itself. Something that would mean, not really have to happen. Something to go out, expand an implication from that unmoved mass of matter in the breast, as in the image of an anguished face, in grief for us, not us as us, us as in a myth, a moral tale, a way to tell the truth that grief is limitless, a way to tell us we must always understand it's we who do such things. We who set the slant, embed the tip, lift the sledge, and drive the nail. Drive the nail, which is the axis upon which turns the brutal human world. Upon the world. Next up, representing Mississippi, Lawson Marchetti. Lawson is finishing his senior year at Jackson Preparatory School in Jackson, Mississippi. His favorite authors include Victor Hugo, John Keats, Billy Collins, and Tennessee Williams. If he could have any superpower, it'd be telepathy, so he could more intimately understand the minds of others. Lawson Marchetti. Sweetness by Stephen Dunn. Just when it has seemed I couldn't bear one more friend waking with a tumor, one more maniac with a perfect reason, often a sweetness has come and changed nothing in the world except the way I stumbled through it. For a while, lost in the ignorance of loving someone or something, the world shrunk to mouth size, hand size, and never seeming small. I acknowledge there is no sweetness that doesn't leave a stain. No sweetness that's ever sufficiently sweet. Tonight a friend called to say his lover was killed in a car he was driving. His voice was low and guttural. He repeated what he needed to repeat, and I repeated the one or two words we have for such grief, until we were speaking only in tones. Often a sweetness comes as if on loan, stays just long enough to make sense of what it means to be alive, then returns to its dark source. As for me, I don't care where it's been or what bitter road it's traveled to come so far to taste so good. Representing Illinois, Mariah L. Brooks. Mariah is a senior at Southeast High School in Springfield, Illinois. She has participated in Poetry Out Loud since her freshman year and was surprised to learn how much students enjoyed participating in it. Aside from poetry recitation, Mariah is passionate about dancing because it allows her to express herself in ways that words can't. Mariah L. Brooks. 
The Song of the Feet by Nikki Giovanni. It is appropriate that I sing the song of the feet. The weight of the body and what the body chooses to bear fall on me. I trampled the American wilderness, forged frontier trails, outran the mob in Tulsa, got caught in Philadelphia, and am still unreparated. I soldiered on in Korea, jungled through Vietnam, sweated out desert storm, caved my way through Afghanistan, tunneled the World Trade Center. And on the worst day of my life, walked behind JFK, shouldered MLK, stood embracing Sister Betty. I wiggle my toes in the sands of time, trusting the touch that controls my motion, basking in the warmth of the embrace days and offers with warm, salty water. It is appropriate I sing the praise of the feet. I am a black woman. Representing Kentucky, Haley Shea Bryan. From Dry Ridge, Kentucky, Haley is a senior at Grant County High School. One of five sisters, Haley is passionate about equal rights for men and women across the globe. She'd like to invent a machine to write all of her essays for her. <laughs> Haley Shea Bryan. Please Don't by Tony Hoagland. Tell the flowers they think the sun loves them. The grass is under the same simple-minded impression about the rain, the fog, the dew. And when the wind blows, it feels so good. They lose control of themselves and swim toggle wildly around, bumping accidentally into their slender neighbors. Forgetful little lotus eaters. <laughs> Solar-powered hydraulics, drawing nourishment up through stems into their thin green skin. High on the expensive chemistry of mitochondrial explosion, believing that the dirt loves them. The night. The stars reaching down a little deeper with their pale albino roots, all dizzy Gillespie with the utter sufficiency of everything. They don't imagine lawnmowers, the four stomachs of the cow, or human beings boots who stop to marvel at their exquisite flexibility and color, they persist in their soft-headed hallucination of happiness. But please, don't mention it. Tell me, what could you possibly gain from being right Representing Nebraska, Bailey Monique Laws. Bailey attends Parkview Christian School in Lincoln, Nebraska, where she is finishing her senior year. Her favorite authors include Lee Young Lee and Tony Hoagland. She'd one day like to invent a pen that writes what you're thinking. Bailey Monique Laws. 
Mama Said by Calvin Forbes. The slice I ate, I want it back. Those crumbs I swept up, I'd like my share again. I can still taste it like it was. The memory by itself is delicious. Each bite was a small miracle, both nourishing and sweet. I wish I had saved just a little bit. I know it wasn't a literal cake. It's the thought that counts, like a gift that's not store-bought, making it even more special. Like a dream that makes you want to go back to sleep. You can't have your cake and eat it too, Mama said. <laughs> I was defiant and hard-headed and answered, yes, I can too. The look she gave me said, boy. I hope you are to fool all your life. Representing Florida, Alexis Schuster. Alexis is finishing up her junior year at Winter Park High School in Winter Park, Florida. Alexis is currently hosting a foreign exchange sister from Germany. During the Poetry Out Loud process, she was surprised to learn more about the people reciting the poems than the poems themselves. Alexis Schuster. Try to Praise the Mutilated World by Adam Zagievsky, translated by Claire Kavanaugh. Try to praise the mutilated world Remember June's long days and wild strawberries, drops of rosé wine, the nettles that methodically overgrow, the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watched the stylish yachts and ships one of them had a long trip ahead of it, while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather a thrush lost and the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. Representing Arkansas, Sydney Bayless. Sydney is a senior at Lake Hamilton High School in Hot Springs, Arkansas. She is passionate about public speaking and the impact words have on the masses. Sydney believes Poetry Out Loud supports that passion and has helped her become a more effective orator. She's used many techniques learned during the competition in her speaking engagements as the reigning Garland County Fair Queen. Sydney Bayless. Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams. 
world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful, deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities. And out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown. And three with a new song's measure can trample an empire down. We, in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth, built Nineveh with our sighing and Babel itself with our mirth and overthrew them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying or one that is coming to birth. Representing Georgia, Samara Elon Huggins. Samara is from Mabeltown, Georgia, and is a senior at Whitefield Academy. If she had a superpower, she'd want the ability to pass through solid objects, particularly people. This would make traveling through crowded streets much more pleasurable. She loves working with children and says that it has made her and her immune system stronger. <laughs> Samara Elon Huggins. Novel by Arthur Rimbaud, translated by Wallace Fowley. One. We aren't serious when we're 17. One fine evening, to hell with beer and lemonade, noisy cafes with their shining lamps, we walk under the green linden trees of the park. The lindens smell good in the good June evenings. At times, the air is so scented that we close our eyes. The wind laden with sounds, the town isn't far, has the smell of grapevines and beer. Two. There you can see a very small patch of dark blue framed by a little branch pinned up by a naughty star that melts in gentle quivers, small and very white. Night in June, 17 years old, we are overcome by it all. The sap is champagne and goes to our head. We talked a lot and feel a kiss on our lips, trembling there like a small insect. Three, our wild heart moves through novels like Robinson Crusoe when, in the light of a pale street lamp, a girl goes by attractive and charming under the shadow of her father's terrible collar. And as she finds you incredibly naive, while clicking her little boots, she turns abruptly and in a lively way, then cavatinas die on your lips. Four, you are in love. Occupied until the month of August, you are in love. Your sonnets make her laugh. All your friends go off. You are ridiculous. Then one evening, the girl you worship deigned to write to you. That evening, you return to the bright cafes. You ask for beer or lemonade. We're not serious when we are 17 and when we have green linden trees in the park. Representing Louisiana, Dejeuner Rochelle Richardson. A junior at Covington High School, Dejeuner is from Folsom, Louisiana. Dejeuner would like to create a program that plants fruit trees in cities to help feed the homeless. If she had a superpower, she'd want the ability to read minds. Dejeuner Rochelle Richardson. 
American Smooth by Rita Dove. We were dancing. It must have been a foxtrot or a waltz. Something romantic, but requiring restraint. Rise and fall, precise execution as we moved into the next song without stopping. Two chests heaving above a seven league stride. Such perfect agony. One learns to smile through ecstatic mimicry, being the cinque non of American smooth. And because I was distracted by the effort of keeping my frame, the left would lean, head turned just enough to gaze out past your ear and always smiling. Smiling. I didn't notice how still you'd become until we had done it for two measures. Four. Achieved flight that swift and serene magnificence. Before the earth remembered who we were and brought us down. Representing Puerto Rico, Sara Rosas. Sara lives in sunny Puerto Rico and is a junior at Escuela San Germán Intermerciana. Sara would like to choose telekinesis as her superpower, and in the future, she'd like to invent glasses that never get dirty. Sara Rosas. I Find No Peace by Sir Thomas Wyatt. I find no peace, and all my war is done. I fear and hope. I burn and freeze like ice. I fly above the wind, yet can I not arise, and not I have all the world I season, loseth nor locketh, holdeth me in prison, yet holdeth me not, yet can I scape no wise, nor letteth me live nor die at my device, and yet of death it giveth me occasion, Without eye and I see, and without tongue I plain. I desire to perish, yet I ask health. I love another, and thus I hate myself. I feed me in sorrow, and laugh in all my pain. Likewise, just pleaseth me both life and death, and my delight is causer of this strife. Representing Tennessee, Marquavius Moore. Marquavius is from Memphis, Tennessee, where he is a senior at Harding Academy of Memphis. Marquavius is the youngest of four children, and he is passionate about social equality and the well-being of others. Being known as the football guy at school, he and others were surprised that poetry became such a big part of his life. Marquavius Moore. I carry your heart with me, I carry it in, by E. E. Cummings. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. <laughs> I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear, and 
Whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I fear no fate, for you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world for beautiful. You are my world, my true. And it's you are whatever a moon has always meant and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide and this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. Representing Oklahoma, Christine Caroline Guerrero. From Lawton, Oklahoma, Christine is in the 11th grade at Lawton High School. Christine is passionate about the world of science, especially neuroscience. She looks up to her two older brothers who are both serving in the armed forces. Christine Caroline Guerrero. The Gaff by C.K. Williams. One. If that someone who's me, yet not me, yet who judges me, is always with me as he is, shouldn't he have been there when I said so long ago that thing I said? If he who breaks me with such not trivial shame for minor sins now, were there then? Shouldn't he have warned me He'd even now devastate me for my unpardonable affront. I'm a child then, yet already I've composed this conscious beast who harries me. Is there anything else I can say with certainty about who I was, except that I, that he, could already draw from infinitesimal transgressions, complex chords of remorse, and orchestrate ever undiminishing retribution from the hapless rest of myself? Two. The son of some friends of my parents has died. And my parents, paying their call, take me along and I'm sent out with the dead boy's brother and some others to play. <laughs> We're joking around, and some words come to my mind, which to my amazement are said. How do you know when you can laugh when somebody dies? Your brother dies? Is what's said. And the others go quiet. The backyard goes quiet. Everyone stares. And I want to know now why that someone in me, who's me yet not me, let me say it. Shouldn't he have told me the contrition cycle would from then be ever upon me? It didn't matter that I really only wanted to know how grief ends and when? Three. I could hear the boy's mother sobbing and stopping, sobbing and stopping. Was the end of her grief already there? Had her someone in her told her it would end? Was there someone in her kinder to her, not tearing at her, as mine did, still does me, for guessing grief someday ends? Is that why her sobbing stops sometimes? She didn't laugh, though. I never heard her. How do you know when you can laugh? Why couldn't have someone been there in me, not just to accuse me, but to explain? 
the kids were playing again. I was playing. I didn't hear anything more from inside. The same way now sometimes what's in me is silent too. And sometimes, though never really, forgets. Representing Indiana, Shelby Newland. Shelby joins us from Bloomington, Indiana, where she is a senior at Bloomington High School South. Shelby's two cats, Giuseppe Garibaldi and Winston Churchill, inspire her daily. Her three sisters inspire her slightly less, but are still pretty cool. Shelby Newland. Try to praise the mutilated world by Adam Zagajewski. Translated by Claire Kavanaugh. Try to praise the mutilated world. Remember June's long days and wild strawberries, drops of rosé wine. The nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watch the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it, while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn, and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world, and the gray feather a thrush lost, and the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. Representing Michigan, Mary-Kate E. Wright. Mary-Kate is finishing her senior year at Owoso High School in Owoso, Michigan. Mary-Kate is passionate about education and hopes to contribute positively to Michigan public schools, especially those in low-income communities. She believes that the schools are vital to the survival of her home region. Mary-Kate E. Wright. The Greatest Grandeur by Patty Ann Rogers. Some say it's in the reptilian dance of the purple-tongued sand goanna, for there, the magnificent translation of tenacity into bone and grace occurs. And some declare it to be an expansive desert, solid rust orange rock like dusk, captured on earth in stone. Simply for the perfect contrast it provides to the blue gray ridge of rain in the distant hills. Some claim the harmonics of shifting electron rings to be most rare, and some the complex motion of seven sandpipers bisecting the arcs and pitches of come and retreat over the mounting hayfield. Others, for grandeur, choose the terror of lightning peals on prairies, 
or the tall, collapsing cathedrals of stormy seas. Because there they feel dwarfed and appropriately helpless. Others select the serenity of that ceiling cellar of stars they see at night on placid lakes, because there they feel assured and universally magnanimous. But it is the dark emptiness contained in every next moment that seems to me the most singularly glorious gift. That void which one is free to fill with processions of men bearing burning cedar knots, or with parades of blue horses, belled and ribboned and stepping sideways with tumbling white-faced mimes or companies of black-robed choristers to fill simply with hammered silver teapots or kiln-dried crockery, tangerine and almond custards, polonaises, polkas, whittling sticks, wailing walls. That space, large enough to hold all invented blasphemies and pieties, 10,000 definitions of God and more, never fully filled, never. Representing Missouri, Emily Bauer. A senior from Baldwin, Missouri, Emily attends Parkway West High School. She'd like to invent a machine that can filter large amounts of water in an economically friendly and cost-efficient manner to provide drinkable water in places that don't have access to clean water. Emily is passionate about music and plays the trumpet, ukulele, and piano. Emily Bauer. It was not death, for I stood up by Emily Dickinson. It was not death, for I stood up and all the dead lie down. It was not night, for all the bells put out their tongues for noon. It was not frost, for on my flesh I felt Sirocco's crawl, nor fire, for just my marble feet could keep a chancel cool, and yet it tasted like them all. The figures I have seen set orderly for burial reminded me of mine, as if my life were shaven and fitted to a frame and could not breathe without a key. And twas like midnight, some, when everything that ticked has stopped and space stares all around, or grisly frosts first autumn morns repeal the beating ground. But most like chaos, stopless, cool, without a chance or spar, or even a report of land to justify despair. Representing Alabama, Raina B. Verser. Raina is from Huntsville, Alabama, and is a junior at New Century Technology High School. Raina is usually quite shy, but memorizing and performing poems for poetry out loud helped her gain a lasting confidence. 
She is passionate about the power words have to absorb and reflect a writer's feelings and, in turn, move an audience. Raina B. Verser. When I Heard the Learned Astronomer by Walt Whitman. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air. And from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Representing Wisconsin, Janessa Gould. From Altoona, Wisconsin, Janessa is finishing her senior year at Altoona High School. She is passionate about art, and it plays a role in nearly every aspect of her life. While Janessa has always loved poetry, Poetry Out Loud taught her greater respect for different types of poems. Janessa Gould. The Art Room by Sharon McCallum. For my sisters, because we did not have threads of turquoise, silver, and gold, we could not sew a sun nor sky, and our hands became balls of fire, and our arms spread open like wings. Because we had no chalk or pastels, no toad forest or morning grass slats of paper, we had no color for creatures. So we squatted and sprang, squatted and sprang. Four young girls, plates heavy on our backs. Our feet were beating drums, drawing rhythms from the floor. Our mouths became woodwinds. Our tongues touched teeth and were reeds. Representing Iowa, Grace Kippel. Grace joins us from Sergeant Bluff, Iowa, where she is a sophomore at Sergeant Bluff Lawton High School. Grace loves dance and has been dancing since she was three. She is on her high school dance team and a competition team. Grace's mother, grandmother, sister, and brother are here today cheering her on. Grace Kippel. The Cross of Snow by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In the long, sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead looks at me from the wall, where around its head the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. Here in this room she died, and soul more white never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose, nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedict. There is a mountain in the distant west that sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years. 
through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. That was the first round. We are moving along now to the second round of the competition. Each student will have the opportunity to recite their second poem. First up, from Kansas, Sarah Grace Katsionis. Personal, by Tony Hoagland. Don't take it personal, they said. But I did. I took it all quite personal. The breeze and the river and the color of the fields, the price of grapefruit and stamps, the wet hair of women in the rain. And I cursed what hurt me, and I praised what gave me joy, the most simple-minded of possible responses. The government reminded me of my father with its deafness and its laws, and the weather reminded me of my mom with her tropical squalls. Enjoy it while you can, they said of happiness. Think first, they said of talk. Get over it, they said, at the school of broken hearts. But I couldn't, and I didn't. And I don't believe in the clean break. I believe in the compound fracture served with the sauce of dirty regret. I believe in saying it all and taking it all back and saying it again for good measure while the air fills up with I'm sorry's like wheeling birds and the trees look seasick in the wind. Oh, life, can you blame me for making a scene? You were that yellow caboose, the moon disappearing over a ridge of cloud. I was the dog chained in some fool's backyard, barking and barking, trying to convince everything else to take it personal, too. From Mississippi, Lawson Marchetti. The Statesman by Ambrose Bierce. How blessed the land that counts among her sons, so many good and wise to execute great feats of tongue when troubles rise. Behold them mounting every stump by speech our liberty to guard. Observe their courage, see them jump and come down hard. Walk up, walk up, each cries aloud, and learn from me what you must do to turn aside the thunder cloud, the earthquake too. Beware the wiles of yonder quack who stuffs the ears of all that pass. I, I alone can show that black is white as grass. They shout through all the day and break the silence of the night as well. They'd make, I wish they'd go and make, of heaven a hell. A advocates free silver, B free trade, and C free banking laws. Free board, clothes, lodging, would from me win warm applause. Lo, D lifts up his voice, you see the single tax on land would fall on all alike. More evenly, no tax at all. With paper money, bellows E, we'll all be rich as lords. No doubt, and richest of the lot will be the chap without. As many cures as addle wits who know not what the ailment is. Meanwhile, the patient foams and spits like a gin fizz. Alas, poor body politic, your fate is all too clearly read to be not altogether quick nor very dead. 
You take your exercise in squirms, your rest in fainting fits between. Well, tis plain that your disorder's worms. Worms fat and lean, worm capital, worm labor, dwell within your maw and muscle scope. Their quarrels make your life a hell, your death a hope. God send you find not such an end to ills, however sharp and huge. God send you convalesce. God send you vermifuge. From Illinois, Mariah L. Brooks. Morning Poem for the Queen of Sunday by Robert Hayden. Lords lost him, his mockingbird, his fancy warbler, Satan's sweet talked her, four bullets hushed her. Who would have thought she'd end that way. Four bullets hushed her, and the world a clang with evil. Who's going to make old, hard, and sinner men tremble now and the righteous rock? Oh, who? And oh, who will sing Jesus down to help with struggling and doing without and being colored all through Blue Monday till way next Sunday? All those angels in there, Cretan clouds and finery, the true believer saw when she reared back her head and sang. All those angels are surely weeping. Who would have thought she'd end that way? Four holes in her heart. The gold works wrecked, but she looks so natural in her big bronze coffin among the broken hearts and gates ajar. It's as if any moment she'd lift her head from its pillow of chill gardenias and turn this quiet into shouting Sunday and make folks forget what she did on Monday. Oh, Satan sweet talked her and four bullets hushed her. Lords lost him his diva. His fancy warbler's gone. Who would have thought? Who would have thought she'd end that way? From Kentucky, Haley Shea Bryan. Self-Portrait by Chase Twitchell. I know I promise to stop talking about her, but I was talking to myself the truth is, she's a child who has stopped growing. So I've always allowed her to tag along. And when she brings her melancholy close to me, I comfort her. <laughs> Naturally, you're curious. You want to know how she became a gnarled branch veiled in diminutive blooms. But I've told you all I know. 
I was sure she had secrets. But she had no secrets. I had to tell her mine. From Nebraska, Bailey Monique Laws. The Seekers of Lice by Arthur Rimbaud, translated by Wallace Fowley. When the child's forehead, full of red torments, implores the white swarm of indistinct dreams, there, come near his bed, two tall, charming sisters with slim fingers that have silvery nails. They seat the child in front of a wide open window where the blue air bays a mass of flowers. And in his heavy hair where the dew falls move their delicate, fearful, and enticing fingers. He listens to the singing of their apprehensive breath, which smells of long, rosy plant honey, and which at times a hiss interrupts. Saliva caught on the lip, or desire for kisses. He hears their black eyelashes beating in the perfumed silence, and their gentle electric fingers make in his half-drunken indolence the death of the little lice crackle under their royal nails. Then, the wine of sloth rises in him. The sigh of an harmonica which could bring on delirium. The child feels, according to the slowness of the caresses surging in him and dying continuously. A desire to cry. From Florida, Alexis Schuster. Sanctuary by Jean Valentine. People pray to each other the way I say you to someone else, respectfully, intimately, desperately, the way someone says you to me, hopefully, expectantly, intensely, Hugh Uster Hughes. You, who I don't know, I don't know how to talk to you. What is it like for you there, here? Well, wanting solitude and talk, friendship, the uses of solitude to imagine, to hear, learning, Braille, to imagine other solitudes, but they will not be mine. 
to wait in the quiet, not to scatter the voices. What are you afraid of? What will happen? All this leaving and meetings, yes, but death. What happens when you die? Not scatter the voices, drown out, not make a house out of my own words, to be quiet in another throat, other eyes, listen for what it is like there, what word, what silence, allowing uncertain to drift in the restlessness, repose, to run like water. What is it like there right now? Listen, the crowding of the street, the room, everyone hunches in against the crowding, holding their breath against dread. What do you dread? What happens when you die? What do you dread in this room now? Not listening, now not watching, safe inside my own skin, to die, not having listened, not having asked, to have scattered life. Yes, I know the thread you have to keep finding over again to follow it back to life I know, impossible sometimes. From Arkansas, Sydney Bayless. The Universe as Primal Scream by Tracy K. Smith. 5 p.m. on the nose. They open their mouths and it rolls out. High, shrill, and metallic. First the boy, then his sister. Occasionally, they both let loose at once. And I think about putting my shoes on to go up and see if it is merely an experiment their parents have been conducting upon the good crystal, which must surely lie shattered to dust on the floor. Maybe the mother is still proud of the four pink lungs she nursed such might. Perhaps. If they hit the magic decibel, the whole building will lift off and will ride to glory like Elijah. If this is it, if this is what their cries are cocked toward, let the sky pass from blue to red to molten gold to black. Let the heaven we inherit approach. Whether it is our dead and Old Testament robes, or a door opening into the roiling infinity of space. Whether it will bend down to greet us like a father or swallow us like a furnace. I'm ready to meet what refuses to let us keep anything for long. What teases us with blessings, bends us with grief. Wizard thief, the great wind rushing to knock our mirrors to the floor to sweep our short lives clean. How mean our racket seems beside it. My stereo on shuffle, the neighbor chopping onions through a wall. All of it just a hiccup against what may never come for us. And the kids upstairs still at it, screaming like the dawn of man, as if something they have no name for has begun to insist upon being born. From Georgia, Samara Elon Huggins. Dream Song 14 by John Berryman. 
life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. After all, the sky flashes, the great sea yearns, we ourselves flash and yearn, and moreover, my mother told me as a boy repeatedly, ever to confess you're bored means you have no inner resources. I conclude now, I have no inner resources because I am heavy bored. Peoples bore me. Literature bores me, especially great literature. Henry bores me with his plights and gripes as bad as Achilles, who loves people, and valiant art, which bores me. And the tranquil hills and gin look like a drag. And somehow, a dog has taken himself and its tail considerably away into mountains or sea or sky, leaving behind me. Wag. From Louisiana, Dejeuner Rochelle Richardson. Ballad of Birmingham by Dudley Randall on the bombing of a church in Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. Mother dear, may I go downtown instead of out to play and march the streets of Birmingham in a freedom march today? No, baby, no, you may not go. For the dogs are fierce and wild and clubs and hoses. Guns in jails aren't good for a little child. But mother, I won't be alone. Other children will go with me and march the streets of Birmingham to make our country free. No, baby, no, you may not go. For I fear those guns will fire. But you may go to church instead and sing in the children's choir. She has combed and brushed her night dark hair and bathed rose petal sweet and drawn white gloves on her small brown hands and white shoes on her feet. The mother smiled to know her child was in the sacred place. But that smile was the last smile to come upon her face. For when she heard the explosion, her eyes grew wet and wild. She raced through the streets of Birmingham calling for her child. She clawed through bits of glass and brick then lifted out a shoe. Oh, here's the shoe my baby wore. But baby, where are you? From Puerto Rico, Sarah Rosas. The Death of Allegory by Billy Collins. I'm wondering what became of all those tall abstractions that used to pose, robed in statuesque in paintings, and parade about on the pages of the Renaissance, displaying their capital letters like license plates, truth cantering on a powerful horse, chastity eyes downcast, flooding with veils. Each one was marble come to life, a thought in a coat, courtesy bowing with one hand always extended, villainy 
sharpening an instrument behind a wall, reason with her crown and constancy, alert behind a helm. They are all retired now, consigned to a Florida for tropes. Justice is there standing by an open refrigerator. Valor lies in bed listening to the rain. Even death has nothing to do but mend his cloak and hood. And all their props are locked away in a warehouse. Hourglasses, globes, blindfolds, and shackles. Even if you called them back, there'd be no places left for them to go. No garden of mirth or bower of bliss. The valley of forgiveness is lined with condominiums, and chainsaws are howling in the forest of despair. Here on the table, near the window, is a vase of peonies. And next to it, black binoculars and a money clip. Exactly the kind of thing we now prefer. Objects that sit quietly on a line, in lowercase. Themselves and nothing more. A wheelbarrow, an empty mailbox, a razor blade resting in a glass ashtray. As for the others, the great ideas on horseback and the long-haired virtues with embroidered gowns. It looks as though they've traveled down the road you see on the final page of storybooks. The one that winds up a green hillside and disappears into an unseen valley where everyone must be fast asleep. From Tennessee, Marquavius Moore. Holy Sonnets, Batter My Heart, Three Person God, by John Donne. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you is yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but... <sighs> to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive, and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me. For I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste except you ravish me. From Oklahoma, Christine Caroline Guerrero. Holy Sonnets, Death Be Not Proud, by John Donne. Death, be not proud. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death. 
nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep which but thy pictures be much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and soul's delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and doth with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. From Indiana, Shelby Newland. The Death of Allegory by Billy Collins. I am wondering what became of all those tall abstractions that used to pose robed and statuesque in paintings and parade about on the pages of the Renaissance displaying their capital letters like license plates. Truth. Cantering on a powerful horse, chastity, eyes downcast, fluttering with veils. Each one was marble come to life, a thought in a coat, courtesy, bowing with one hand always extended. Villainy, sharpening an instrument behind a wall, reason with her crown, and constancy, alert behind the helm. They are all retired now, consigned to a Florida for tropes. Justice is there standing by an open refrigerator. Valor lies in bed, listening to the rain. Even death has nothing to do but mend his cloak and hood, and all their props are locked away in a warehouse, hourglasses, globes, blindfolds, and shackles. Even if you called them back, there are no places left for them to go, no garden of mirth or bower of bliss. The valley of forgiveness is lined with condominiums, and chainsaws are howling in the forest of despair. Here on the table, near the window, is a vase of peonies, and next to it, black binoculars and a money clip, exactly the kind of thing we now prefer, objects that sit quietly on a line in lowercase, themselves and nothing more, a wheelbarrow, an empty mailbox, a razor blade resting in a glass ashtray. As for the others, the great ideas on horseback and long-haired virtues in embroidered gowns, it looks as though they have traveled down that road you see on the final page of storybooks, the one that winds up a green hillside and disappears into an unseen valley where everyone must be fast asleep. From Michigan, Mary-Kate E. Wright. El Ulvido by Judith Ortiz Kofer. It is a dangerous thing 
to forget the climate of your birthplace, to choke out the voices of dead relatives when in dreams they call you by your secret name. It is dangerous to spurn the clothes you were born to wear for sake of fashion. Dangerous to use weapons and sharp instruments you are not familiar with. Dangerous to disdain the plaster saints before which your mother kneels praying with embarrassing fervor that you survive in the place you have chosen to live. A bare, cold room with no pictures on the walls. A forgetting place where she fears you will die of loneliness and exposure. Jesus, Maria, y Jose, she says. El olvido is a dangerous thing. From Missouri, Emily Bauer. Saquan Papalotos by Brenda Cardenas. In memory of Jose Antonio Borciaga, 1947 to 1996, we are chameleons. We become chameleon. Jose Antonio Borciaga. We are space between the black orange blur of a million monarchs on their two generation migration south to Fur Crown Michoacan where tree trunks will sprout feathers, a forest of paper-thin wings. Our Mexica, cocooned in the membranes de la Madre Tierra, say, we are reborn, Saquan papalotos, mariposas negras y anaranjadas, in whose sweep the dead whisper. We are between the flicker of a chameleon's tail that turns his desert blue backbone to jade or pink sand, the snakeskin fraternal twins of solstice and equinox, the ashen dawn silvering dusk, la oración as it leaves the lips, the tug from sleep the glide into dreams that husk out mestizo memory. We are one life passing through the prism of all others, gathering color and song, sempasuchil and drum, to leave a rhythm scattered on the wind, dust tinting the tips of fingers as we slip into our new light. From Alabama, Raina B. Verser. Very Large Moth by Craig Arnold, after DHL. Your first thought when the light snaps on and the black wings clatter about the kitchen it's a bat. The clear part of your mind considers rabies. The other part does not consider, knows only to startle and cower away from the slap of its wings. Though it is soon clearly not a bat, but a moth and harmless still. You are shy of it. It clings to the hood of the stove. Not black, but brown. Its orange eyes sparkle like televisions. Its leg joints are 
large enough to count. How could you kill it? Where would you hide the body? A creature so solid must have room for a soul. And if this is so, why not in a creature half its size or half its size again? And so on down to the ants. Clearly, it must be saved. Caught in a shopping bag and rushed to the front door, afraid to crush it. Feeling the plastic rattle loosen into the night air. It batters the porch light, throwing fitful shadows around the landing. That was a really big moth is all you can say to the doorman who has watched your whole performance with a smile. The half compassion and half horror we feel for the creatures we want not to hurt and prefer not to touch From Wisconsin, Janessa Gould. Mrs. Caldera's House of Things by Gregory Dejankian. You are sitting in Mrs. Caldera's kitchen. You are sipping a glass of lemonade and try not to be too curious about the box of plastic hummingbirds behind you, the tray of timeless forks at your elbow. You have heard about the back room where no one else has ever gone, and whatever enters remains. Refrigerator doors, fuse coils, mower blades, milk bottles, pistons, gears. You never know, she says, rummaging through a cedar chest of recipes, when something will come of use. There is a vase of pencil tips on the table, a bowl full of miniature wheels and axles. Upstairs, where her children slept, the doors will not close. The stacks of magazines are burgeoning. There are snowshoes and lampshades, bed springs and picture tubes, and boxes and boxes of irreducibles. You imagine the headline in the Literalist Express. House, founders under weight of past. But Mrs. Caldera is baking cookies. She's humming a song from childhood. Her arms are heavy and strong. They have held babies, a husband, tractor parts and gas tanks. What have they not found a place for? It is getting dark. You have sat for a long time. If you move, you feel something will be disturbed. There is room enough only for your body. Stay a while, Mrs. Caldera says, and never have you felt so valuable. From Iowa, Grace Keipel. Dear Reader, by Rita May Reese. You have forgotten it all. You have forgotten your name, where you lived, who you loved, why? I 
am simply your nurse. Terse and unlovely, I point to things and remind you what they are. Chair, book, daughter, soup. And when we are alone, I tell you what lies in each direction. This way is death, and this way after a longer walk is death, and that way is death, but you won't see it until it is right in front of you. Once after your niece had been to visit you and I said something about how you must love her or she must love you or something useless like that, you gripped my forearm in your terrible swift hand and said, she is everything. You gave me a shake, everything to me. And then you fell back into the well, deep in the well of everything. And I stand at the edge and call, chair, book, daughter, soup. Would all competitors please return to the stage? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your 18 state champions. Out of a nationwide competitive field, these students rose to the top, and I think you've seen why. We'd now like to award a plaque to each competitor for their achievement in representing their state at the national finals. Presenting the awards are Steve Young from the Poetry Foundation and Eleanor Billington from the National Endowment for the Arts. Raina B. Verser from Alabama. <laughs> Sydney Bayless from Arkansas. <laughs> Alexis Schuster, Florida. Samara Elon Huggins, Georgia. <laughs> Mariah L. Brooks from Illinois. <laughs> Shelby Newland, Indiana. Grace Keipel, Iowa. Sarah Grace Katsionis, Kansas. Haley Shea Bryan, Kentucky. Dejanae Rochelle Richardson, Louisiana. <laughs> Mary Kate E. Wright, Michigan.
Lawson Marchetti, Mississippi. Emily Bauer, Missouri. <laughs> Bailey Monique Laws, Nebraska. Christine Caroline Guerrero, Oklahoma. Sarah Rosas, Puerto Rico. Marquavius Moore, Tennessee. and Janessa Gold, Wisconsin. <laughs> the eight students with the highest scores in the first two rounds will have the opportunity to recite their third poem. This score will be added to their scores from the first two rounds to determine the three students who will advance to the national finals tomorrow night. Remember that students were scored on six categories, physical presence, voice and articulation, dramatic appropriate, evidence of understanding, overall performance and accuracy. Overall performance and accuracy are worth more than the other categories. Those eight students, our regional finalists are Mariah L. Brooks, Illinois. <laughs> Samara Elon Huggins, Georgia. <laughs> Dejane Rochelle Richardson, Louisiana. <laughs> Shelby Newland, Indiana. Mary Kate E. Wright, Michigan. <laughs> Emily Bauer, Missouri. <laughs> Raina B. Verser, Alabama. <laughs> and Grace Keipel, Iowa. First for round three, we will have Mariah L. Brooks from Illinois. On Virtue by Phyllis Wheatley. Oh, thou bright jewel in my aim, I strive to comprehend thee. Thine own words declare wisdom is higher than a fool can reach. I cease to wonder, and no more attempt thine height to explore or fathom thy profound. But, oh my soul, sink not into despair. Virtue is near thee, and with gentle hand would now embrace thee, hovers o'er thine head. Fain would the heaven-born soul with her converse, then seek, then court her for her promised bliss. Auspicious queen, thine heavenly pinion spread and lead celestial chastity along. Lo, now her sacred retinue descends, arrayed in glory from the orbs above. Attend me, virtue, through my youthful years. 
Oh, leave me not to the false joys of time, but guide my steps to endless life and bliss, greatness or goodness. Say what I shall call thee, to give an higher appellation still. Teach me a better strain, a nobler lay. O oh, thou, enthroned with cherubs in the realms of day. From Georgia, Samara Elon Huggins. The Farmer by W.D. Earhart. Each day I go into the fields to see what is growing and what remains to be done. It is always the same thing. Nothing is growing. Everything needs to be done. Plow, harrow, disc, water, Pray till my bones ache and hands rub blood raw with honest labor. All that grows is the slow, intransigent intensity of need. I have sown my seed on soil guaranteed by poverty to fail. But I don't complain, except to passers-by who ask me why I work such barren earth. They would not understand me if I stooped to lift a rock and hold it like a child, or laughed, or told them it is their poverty I labor to relieve. For them, I complain. A farmer of dreams knows how to pretend. A farmer of dreams knows what it means to be patient. Each day I go into the fields. From Louisiana, Dejeuner Rochelle Richardson. Epitaph on the tombstone of a child, the last of seven that died before, by Aphra Bain. This little, silent, gloomy monument contains all that was sweet and innocent. The softest prattler that e'er found a tongue, his voice was music and his words, a song which now each listening angel, smiling, hears such pretty harmonies, compose the spheres, wanton as unfledged cupids, ere their charms has to learn the little arts of doing harms. Fair as young cherubins, as soft and kind, and though translated, cannot be refined. The seventh dear pledge the nuptial joys had given. Toiled here on earth, retired to rest in heaven where they, the shining hosts of angels, fill, spread their gay wings before the throne and smile. From Indiana, Shelby Newland. I Remember, I Remember, by Thomas Hood. I remember, I remember, the house where I was born, the little window where the sun came peeping in at morn. He never came a wink too soon, nor brought too long a day, but now 
I often wish the night had borne my breath away. I remember, I remember the roses, red and white, the violets and the lily cups, those flowers made of light, the lilacs where the robin built and where my brother set, the laburnum on his birthday, the tree is living yet. I remember, I remember where I was used to swing and thought the air must rush as fresh to swallows on the wing. My spirit flew in feathers then that is so heavy now, and summer pools could hardly cool the fever on my brow. I remember, I remember, the fir trees dark and high. I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was a childish ignorance, but now tis little joy to know I'm further off from heaven than when I was a boy. From Michigan, Mary Kate E. Wright. When You Are Old by William Butler Yeats. When you are old and gray and full of sleep, and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with a love false or true but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. From Missouri, Emily Bauer. What it looks like to us in the words we use by Ada Limon. All these great barns out here in the outskirts, black creosote boards knee deep in the blue grass. They look so beautifully abandoned, even in use. You say they look like arcs after the seas dried up. I say they look like pirate ships. And I think of that walk in the valley where Jay said, you don't believe in God? And I said, no, I believe in this connection we all have to nature, to each other, to the universe. And she said, yeah, God. And how we stood there, low beasts among the white oaks, Spanish moss, and spider webs, obsidian shards stuck in our pockets, woodpecker flurry, and I refused to call it so. So instead, we looked up 
at the unruly sky, its clouds in simple animal shapes we could name, though we knew they were really just clouds, disorderly and marvelous and ours. From Alabama, Raina B. Verser. Brian, age seven, by Mark Doty. Grateful for their tour of the pharmacy, the first grade class has drawn these pictures, each self-portrait taped to the window glass, faces wide to the street, round and available, <laughs> with parallel lines for hair. I like this one best. Brian, whose attenuated name fills a quarter of the frame, stretched beside impossible legs descending from the ball of his torso, two long arms springing from that same central sphere. He breathes here on his page. It isn't craft that makes this figure come alive. Brian draws just balls and lines and wobbly crown strokes. Why do some marks seem to thrill with life, possess a portion of the nervous energy in their maker's hand? That big curve of a smile reaches nearly to the rim of his face. He holds a towering ice cream, brown spheres teetering on their cone. A soda fountain gift, half the length of him, as if it were the flag of his own country, held high by the unadorned black line of his arm. Such naked support for so much delight. Artless boy. He's found a system of beauty. He shows us pleasure and what pleasure resists. The ice cream is delicious. He is frail beside his relentless standard. From Iowa, Grace Keipel. Entirely by Lewis McNeese. If we could get the hang of it entirely, it would take too long. All we know is the splash of words in passing and falling twigs of song. And when we try to eavesdrop on the great presences, it is rarely that by a stroke of luck we can appropriate even a phrase entirely. If we could find our happiness entirely in somebody else's arms, we should not fear the spears of the spring nor the city's yammering fire alarms, but as it is, the spears each year go through our flesh and almost hourly bell or siren banishes the blue eyes of love entirely. And if the world were black or white entirely and all the charts were plain, Instead of a mad weir of tigrish waters, a prism of delight and pain, we might be sure where we wish to go. Or again, we might be merely bored. But in brute reality, there is no road that is right entirely. If I could invite our top eight finalists to return to the stage, please. <laughs> the 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is the moment we've all been waiting for. As I read your name, please step forward. This, this region's honorable mention award goes to the student who finished in fourth place. This student will receive a $1,000 cash prize and $500 for their school library to purchase poetry books. And the honorable mention for Region 2 goes to Raina B. Verser. Three students will move on to compete tomorrow night in the national finals. They will receive at least a $1,000 cash prize and $500 for their school library, but we all know they've got their eyes on the $20,000 cash prize that is awarded to the national champion. In no particular order, here are your top three. From Georgia, Samara Elon Huggins. From Missouri, Emily Bauer. And from Illinois, Mariah Brooks. Congratulations to all of the state champions we have seen today. Thank you so much to our American Sign Language interpreters for this round, Jessica Gabrian and Cheryl Ringel. And thank you all so much for coming. The next round of semifinal competitions will begin today at 5 p.m., so go out, get some fresh air, and join us again at 5 as students from the Upper Northwest and West battle it out for the last three spots in the national finals. We look forward to seeing you all here tomorrow night for the national finals competition. Thank you.